This week on Arizona Illustrated, the art and artists behind Tucson's downtown murals. The ones that we ended up selecting were innovative approaches to what is part of public art. A place to cool down for those who don't have a place. A place where they're welcome, can relax, stay here as long as they need to. Life lessons through purposeful percussion. It's helping their child actually learn to be good people. And building the biosphere in 1989. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. If you've been through downtown Tucson recently, you might have noticed a significant increase in color. Walls and sides of buildings, once beige or off-white, are now awash in orange, yellow, blue, and red. An outdoor gallery of imagery inspired by the city's rich cultural diversity, history, and urban fabric. These are the downtown murals. I wanted to do this project because a friend of mine moved to Richmond, Virginia, and he randomly sent me all these pictures of these murals on these walls, and he said, wouldn't this be great for Tucson? And so I started looking into it. When I saw the grant opportunity through the Tohono O'odham, I said, wow, what a great opportunity. I wrote up the grant, and I guess they thought it was a good idea. <laughs> this is really big. But I, I, I like it. it. It really makes a great impression. You know, Tucson is many things, uh, but shy is not one of them. There were a lot of people that said, oh, you know, the city has tried murals before and they didn't really work. And I tried to keep those kind of noises quiet because I knew that, you know, with the right partners that we could definitely execute a pretty successful program. A friend of mine told me about it. She saw the call to artists on the news. I went to the Tucson Arts Brigade page, saw the, um, the application. We kind of went around downtown and identified different buildings that we wanted to see beautified. There was a mention that it they were the largest buildings in Tucson and, and I thought, man, I've been painting the city my entire life. I should have one of those murals. So after we selected the areas, I wrote an RFP outlining kind of what we wanted to see in the artwork. We submitted a floating design, and then when the wall owner accepted it, we came and actually got to see the wall. The ones that we ended up selecting uh, were mainly associated with the quality of the work that they'd done, their previous experience, and really kind of innovative approaches to um, what is part of public art. I turned in the application, I could not stop thinking about it, and I was just like on pins and needles waiting, so it was like surreal when I actually heard that I was chosen. This is the first thing I've ever done this big. So the three figures represent new beginnings and nurturing and growth. I learned a ton. Working on this scale is like, it's so drastically different than working small, but then you see the similarities and you see the, the skills that I've already acquired and how they apply on a grand scale, and that's kind of interesting. For me, the biggest thing is you can't, um, you can't move, move it around. You can't flip it upside down to take a look at it. You can't turn it to the wall for two weeks. Ready, go. Forward. Art. It's like a Wes Anderson movie, except not funny <laughs> with tears instead of laughter. <laughs> we met last winter, yeah. and I felt like we had a, a really strong connection yeah. um, pretty quickly. And Rachel has more public art experience than I, and I wanted more experience. The piece is called Sagrada Corazón de Tucson, which means Sacred Heart of Tucson. The executive director of Cafe 54 told us in a meeting that she chose our mural because of heart representation and that Cafe 54 is a heart-focused and heart-centered 
organization. So when she said that, it just like, for me, it yeah. clicked. Well, let's, I'd like to go over and get that bat. The texture of the wall. The texture of the wall, yes. And it's out to get us. It is, it's um, very bumpy, like trying to grind cold, hard butter into an English muffin. 100%. All day long. Ooh. Drop it like it's hot. It's scary, but but it's fun. You know, I didn't know that this was going to be the wall, so basing my design, I had to fit it to that at a later time, and so I pretty much have to paint a few things and then come right back down, step step back a couple hundred feet, and then go back up. Yeah, What's that? I'm convinced that you know everybody. What? Because you do. I just know a lot of people, huh? I know. Well, see, now you're going to know a lot of people. You should, man. You got to get that artwork out there. I have an assistant, Christina Perez, him. and she's working great with me. And she'll she'll run the machine, and I'll paint, and then I'll run the machine, and she'll paint. I got involved through the Tucson Arts Brigade. I said to myself, if they need help, I'm going to do it. I went to work, and I told them, hey, I'm not going to work for a month. I'm going to be helping with a mural. And they said, OK. <laughs> I like the challenge. This thing is going to be fully detailed and with meticulous line work and uh, the best the best color and the best composition that I can possibly paint. Well, I kind of just did it. I kind of just <laughs> didn't really ask for permission. The way that we justify this program through economic development is that you know, beautifying the streets not only brings visual attraction, but it also brings people downtown. It gets them to kind of linger longer. Businesses that are located close to the murals, they tend to see higher foot traffic, and that's been pretty much well established throughout the country. This area was pretty much dead before the studios started moving in, and it really makes a large economic impact. Oh, I'm ecstatic. Yeah, watching it. When it first started, I was questioning what it was going to be like. And then as he continued, the detail work he puts into the project is just amazing. It was fun. He's a great mentor. Grab, grab that map. And it's cool. People stop and take pictures. People that you don't know compliment you and thank you. And I'm going to miss it. <laughs> I'm just not going to miss the sun beating up on me. It's a great relief. We're it's, very happy. It's going to be nice to detox some paint and yes. be out of the sun for a while. We've got a lot of happy people down here, too. I just went and did a lot of line work and then filled in the colors. Um, I waited till very late in the process to do the detail on the face. I like the idea of having something that I can take family and friends to for a long time. Now I have more murals floating around my head. Like I was working at home on some domestic tasks and then I was like, I need to, I need to draw this. I hope this, this, you know, doesn't remain the biggest mural in Tucson. I mean, I'd like to be the one that paints that, of course, but, but I hope that more of, of this size actually pop up. We've applied for another round of grants. Uh, we've asked for double the amount that we received previously because we would like to expand it to the greater uh, downtown area. So I just want to again offer congratulations and thanks to everyone who's been involved with this project because it helps make Tucson a more beautiful and vibrant city. With summer comes heat, and each year residents of Southern Arizona contend with the potentially dangerous conditions that come with it. In June, at least six people lost their lives to Arizona's extreme heat, and Tucson saw more than 20 days of 100 plus degree temperatures, including the third hottest day on record. What's it like for those who have no shelter, no place to call home?
But I used to be homeless. I used to be homeless. I was homeless for eight years in El Paso. Homeless, living in a tunnel. So I already know how it is not to take a shower, how it is to go without eating. Because my stomach's been hurt a lot of times. And I have gone dumpster diving. So I already know what they're going through. And it ain't, it's no joke to be, to be homeless. Some of them get frustrated and get mad and say, man, I hate this life. James Hyatt says he's now using his social security to rent a modest place of his own. He's here in Santa Rita Park on Tucson's south side to visit friends. They come over here to get in the shade, to stay out of the sun because, you know, some of them, they're homeless and they're, there's no shade anywhere, so they come over here to get out of the sun. I mean, the sun, the sun is not, it's no joke. I mean, you go out there, you don't got no water, and, you, and you're out there, you, I mean, you'll fall out. You can feel it when you ride the bike. When I, like I'm riding the bike in the sun, you can feel that heat pounding on you. You can feel it. I mean, it's just like an oven. There is one place where folks in need can go to get out of the heat, cool off, and rest. It's known as the St. Francis Cooling Center, now housed at Z Mansion in downtown Tucson. We're grateful to be at the Z Mansion. They're our host this summer uh, for the cooling center. This is our 10th summer we've had the cooling center going. We've been in different locations over the years, and this is probably the nicest ambiance we've ever had, although it's a little bit smaller space than what we're used to having. This one, cleaning supplies. For the past five years, the cooling center operated out of Central City Assembly of God, where they had more space and could more easily accommodate those in need. The last uh, cooling center we had, we averaged 80 folks a day, and we had, a little bit, we had a little bit more room where we were able to have about 35 cots, and those would often fill up, and then we'd have chairs along the wall. Brother David Bior is a Franciscan friar and the founder of the St. Francis Cooling Center. For the cooling center, I think the operative word is hospitality. It's a temporary place where during the summer, during the hottest months of the summer, where homeless people or anyone in need can come and get, get cooled off. It's a place where they're welcome, uh, can, can relax, and uh, stay here as long as they need to. We're open for four hours a day, so that's a good chance to get some rest and, and uh, re renew the energy. There's a restroom available. Um, and there's a limited amount of cots to lay down on or chairs to sit in, in air condition or out here on the back patio. And so to be, ha be able to have a place to come and cool off is really an important place, a place where they're welcome, because there's so many places where they're not welcome. Their doors open at noon and close at 4 p.m., Monday through Saturday. Brother David, as he is known, sees this work as part of his calling. And especially to go out, have our hearts go out to those who are um, the most disrespected, who are, the, who are the outcasts of our time. In the time of St. Francis, it was the lepers. And for here in our era, oftentimes it's the homeless. While they have less room, word has gotten out, and they are again averaging 70 to 80 guests per day. Z Mansion is located on North Church Avenue and owned by Methodist minister Tom Hill and his wife. This is just one of many ways they work to alleviate homelessness in Tucson. I was hungry, you know, and, and, and thirsty. I was looking for something cold to drink, and, and, and that's when I started feeling a little dizzy. 47-year-old Robert Lopez is homeless. A friend brought him here to get out of the heat. Yeah, no, my buddy right here, he said, there's a place we go to cool off. I was happy to go. I was a little hot. I don't got much as clothes you know, covering me up right now, so I'm, I'm soaking in all the sun when I'm out there. The sun beats you down. I mean, every, everybody, everybody. Forehead shiny, you know what I mean? This, you know what I mean? The sweat, just look at them, They're tired. So just man, take their shoes off, you know what I mean? Cool their feet off. But coming inside here, it was just the the coolness just swallows you up. Just like if you went out to the heat, it just swallows you up. And, and, and this place is cool. <laughs> it's like an oasis in the desert. Sack lunches are provided by Kerry Dodd Community Kitchen. An unlimited supply of ice water and cold fruit punch are also on hand. It's a comfortably quiet environment with air conditioning and ceiling fans, where guests can read, converse, and sleep. A stark contrast to life on the street. It's just, it's, it's a brutal place. 
And then you got, and when you do lay down or go to sleep, then you got to worry about somebody going through your bags or whatnot. Carl Zawatsky is a longtime volunteer of the cooling center and the winter shelter. He knows firsthand what it's like to be homeless. I mean, I, I did my stint on, on the street years ago in Miami. Life and death sometimes. I mean, it really is life and death sometimes. You know, we got five more boxes. You know, if a person, they pass out in this heat, they're liable not to wake up. And um, so, you know, just, just that fact. And then you got people with a mental illness or they just don't feel good and they just want a place just to get underneath a tree or something. And then if they do pass out, it's like, we wake up, where's my bag? While this is a low demand shelter, there is an expectation of peacefulness and respect for one another. The most important thing is a nice, not only cool, but a safe and sane environment. So we go out of our way to, uh, to do that. If somebody is disruptive, you know, that we have an obligation for the rest of the people to nip that in the bud and just ask that person to move along. So if you want a safe and sane place to get off the street for four hours, this is the place to come. All are welcome, no questions asked. There is nobody checking nothing at the door. No IDs, what, it's humanity. You know, what, what's your credentials for coming into the cooling center? You're a human being in need, period, that's it. Men and women, and dogs, even on our list over there, we have uh, men, women, and pets on the bottom. We knocked, so every day a few pets come in too. The cooling center is primarily funded through private donations to Franciscan Ministries. 10 years in, this work continues but they'd like to do more. The biggest need we have right now, is, is, and uh, the Z Mansion has been stretching to allow us to be here, and we're so grateful, and it's a smaller space. We, if somebody had a space that was air conditioned that was larger, where we could welcome 60 or 70 or 80 people a day, if it was somewhere not too far from the downtown area, it'd be a wonderful gift. Well, it's like this, it's like right over here, we got what, five, six cots, usually we got about 40. Ideally, it would be nice for to have at least 20 or 30 of these cots for a guy to come in and lay down, take a two, three hour nap or something. Have a good one now. The streets are less harsh when we have more places like this. Our, our, our human needs are more than the, than the food and, and the water. We have human needs of compassion, of friendliness, a place where we're feeling welcome. And that's a part of our, um, our human DNA. And when that's respected, uh, love is even more present. For Robert Lopez, the cooling center allows him to carry on. I, I have no job, I have no place to stay, so all my energy is spent on trying to get to the next meal and get to the next cool spot or, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to survive and this place is just like, rejuvenates me, you know what I mean? Bring me back to life. So now my body, can, the core temperature can drop down and I can, I mean, when I do get ready to go, I can, I can continue my journey. Did you learn to play a musical instrument as a child? If so, what did you get out of the experience? One Tucson area percussion instructor has developed an approach of teaching music that transcends simply playing the instrument itself. was 14, my band director said, hey Brian, we have these beginners and you're doing a pretty good job playing these days. What if we send the beginners to you for lessons? How would that be? And I thought, wow, that sounds like a great part-time job to me. So almost nonstop since I was 14, I've been teaching private lessons. Great. And what other things can you do to get this decrescendo over these four bars? and I enjoyed the relationships and uh, sitting with them and just helping them figure things out. I mean, it was just, I really enjoyed that nurturing process, you know, from the very beginning. Nice, exactly. The hardest part is about moving really fast because sometimes you have to move from left to right really quickly and you have to get used to the speed and to make sure you hit the right note. 
at the right time. It makes me feel like I can like express my um, emotion sometimes through the music. Like if the music's like supposed to sound like a little sad in a way, it makes me like express a little bit some sad stuff. It calms me down sometimes too. Take a look at it. Take a look at it on the music. What's the most efficient way to get this stuff across to a really young mind? Let's just start at the top. I created this book called uh, The Snare Drum Plays the Zoo. Uh, I started it in 1999, and I finally actually printed it, self-published it, in 2004. It essentially takes uh, something that every child is an expert at, which is language, and converts their way of saying certain words into playing those rhythms on the drum. And I chose the animal kingdom to be my rhythmical words that are used in the book. Combine them with a certain hand pattern on the drum, and it's always the same experience for every rhythm. And then I show them the symbols that go with each of the rhythms that they've learned how to speak and play. And now the symbol just means, oh, just do this. So it's that and that, yeah? Mezzo piano and a crescendo at the end. This way you can focus more on what's happening here and less on what's on the page. It's really based on the same way we all learn how to speak and then read and then write language. In percussion, you have so many different instruments to choose from. Like, there's a giant variety of them, so it's really amazing that you get to play all different kinds of instruments. That's fantastic. Well, I like it when I'm challenged, so I'll tell them, like, what I want to be better. They'll tell me, uh, make it the Libby King standard. A few years ago, a friend of mine, Brad Richter, who's been doing a program called Lead Guitar since 1999, Brad contacted me and he said, Brian, we'd like to start a percussion program that uses the same model as our lead guitar program. So would you be interested in doing that with us? So I said, Brad, I would love to do that. Let's, let's get it going. So we decided to call it Upbeat. And these programs are offered to the Tucson community by both UA Presents and the University of Arizona's College of Fine Arts. King, Fisher, King and they work on group drumming skills. They're learning to read music notation. They're learning to play as a group. They're doing things like composing their own music. They're doing a little bit of improvisation. Just like when you took your first steps and you might have fallen down, you know, you just have to keep doing it over and over again and getting these kids this practice this early, getting them thinking creatively, thinking outside the box. I mean, it has plenty of dividends in music that it's gonna pay off on, but that kind of thinking pays off in any realm of, of life. <laughs> It's a great opportunity for kids to learn how to express themselves in a different way. And some students really thrive in that type of environment, which is great for kids to be allowed to show how good they can be at something at school when they may not be good at other things. And so if we can get a kid hooked on music at a younger age, then when they go to the junior high and the high school, they have something automatically to hook into where they're going to be able to form positive relationships with kids who are, have the same interest as they do. And they're more likely to finish high school and be more successful when they're in secondary school. Learning that sense of you have to do your best, not just for your sake, but for everybody's sake, I think is really important. And it's amazing hearing some of these kids' stories and the things that they have to deal with. And then they come in here, and it's like, you're a band, or you're an orchestra, or you're part of the, the upbeat class. And none of that stuff matters. Here, you're a musician. Here, you're playing with us. Here, we're making music together. Just maintaining and developing a relationship with the student is absolutely top priority. Because without that, you know, nothing else can really take place on a genuine level. And I have students who are going on, you know, once they graduate from high school, they're, they're some of the best jazz drummers in the country, and they're moving on to Manhattan School of Music or auditioning for Juilliard. The important thing that my students get is just to get a positive connection with themselves, 
so that they know how to talk themselves through difficulties, challenges, and come out on the other side with more understanding of themselves and the challenges that they've actually faced and gotten through and succeeded at. Yeah, it was much better, right? That's really what this is about. And it doesn't matter if we're playing drums or violin or, or really anything. It's, uh, it's just about how do I go from not knowing something to being an expert at it as quickly as I can, as honestly with myself as I possibly can. Cool? Yeah. Great. You can share the love of your instrument together and even the whole band. You share the love of making music together. So I want to be in things like that. And I think that I will continue with music because I love it so much. So there's this development of self-awareness, awareness in the moment, like what's really happening right now as I'm having this experience. I know that the best thing to do is just give them something every time they walk in and let them leave with a positive outlook on whatever we're doing. It's way more than that. It's helping their child actually learn to be good people. And that's what I strive for every day when I walk down here. It's, it's, it's really important to me. There's a tract of land just off State Route 77, north of Tucson, that was known as the Samaniego CDO Ranch in the 1800s. By the 1960s and 70s, it was the site of a conference center for Motorola and the University of Arizona. Space Biospheres Ventures bought the property in 1984 and began construction of a facility to research and develop self-sustaining space colonization technology. Then they began building the Biosphere. It is called Biosphere 2, a totally self-contained environment complete with rainforest, desert, marsh, and marine habitats. And this is its first wall, now being lifted into place at the Sunspace Ranch near Oracle. Just over four years ago, this was open desert. Now it's a keyhole look at life into the next century. In Biosphere 2, the planet Earth is Biosphere 1. Life on Earth will be replicated. This building will be home for eight biospherians who will live and work here over the next two years. The group, four men and four women, will conduct scientific experiments and will be totally dependent on their environment for their survival. They will live their lives with special breeds of goats, chickens, and fish, and they will grow much of their own food. They will live among specially selected plants with heightened adaptability. Botanist Linda Lee says she's hoping that she'll be among the eight who will finally be selected to fly this Earth station. If I evaluate where people walk during a course of a day, frequently people don't even cover two and a half acres of area. And I'll be inside an area that'll be two and a half acres, not just of a city, but of seven different biomes, an extremely diverse two and a half acres. She calls Biosphere 2 a remarkable opportunity and says unequivocally that there's nothing else like it on Earth. And she's right. Much of the work on Biosphere 2 will be complete later this year. But the knowledge that scientists will have gleaned during its lifespan will be helpful for untold generations, a quantum leap in scientific knowledge. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, what's it like to skate with the saddle tramps? Southern Arizona's Chiricahua Mountains and four generations of jewelers, the Patania family. I'm Tom McNamara, see you next week.